much. Um, uh, th thank you, Pete, for that very uh, generous uh, introduction. Hello to everyone. Uh, it's really, really lovely to be here today. Um, I've managed to dip in, in and out a bit because I had some of the commitments today, but uh, what a fantastic day uh, so far. It's been, it's been really good. So hello to all the patients out there. And I, I would like to thank Leo and Dr. Granus and the Sarcoidosis Charity for the kind invite to come and talk to you today. So I think what Dr. Cronus wanted me to um, touch upon today was some of the work that your uh, lung healthcare professionals have been doing in the background that may have been slightly unseen. So they wanted me to do uh, something around the British Thoracic Society, which is our um, medical specialist society for lung healthcare professionals, um, and talk about our response to the, to the pandemic and obviously try and focus that in a bit on interstitial lung disease. So what is the British Thoracic Society? Many of you may, may not be that aware of it. So it, it's, a, it's a registered charity uh, with members, and those members consist of uh, respiratory doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, physiologists, those are the, uh, the healthcare professionals that take you through your breathing tests, and um, also uh, scientists and other people that are interested in, in respiratory care. Um, the aim of the British Thoracic Society is fairly clear. I think it's about championing excellence in diagnosis, treatment and care of people with all lung diseases and also in those who are delivering it. And the BTS is intrinsically involved with training respiratory uh, professionals in the exam setting, uh, delivering exams and driving up standards of care. So we, we, we have a programme of guide and guidelines and guidance that we produce every so often for diseases. And this uh, allows a good standard of care amongst the respiratory professionals, but also people from other specialities can take those, those guidelines and, and apply them and give good respiratory care outside of their specialist area in an easy manner. We encourage uh, support and support research. And we also deliver two respiratory conferences each year where we share information and uh, in hopefully improve, improve knowledge. So I had to sort of sit back and have a think when I got this uh, title of this talk as to really what to focus on. The BTS is, it does a lot of stuff normally in non-COVID times, but it's been extremely busy, as you can imagine, during, during COVID. So I, I've made this brief list of things that I think are ILD sort of specific, and there's four things here that I'm going to run through about things that I think made a difference to ILD care. I just remind that when I say ILD, that incorporates sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis, as you'll know, is a form of interstitial lung disease and covers many diseases. So one of the things that we did, we did a lot of website guidance. And in particular, we provided quite early on a document for the care that we thought would be best delivered for ILD patients within the pandemic. And this was put together by a number of ILD specialists and specialist centres, a number of collaborators put that document together. We also took that to the next level and we published national guidance uh, about ILD management, which went out on the NICE website. So. I know we've got some overseas participants today, so you may not be familiar with what, what NICE is. NICE is the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, which is a body that covers care in England and Wales, and it's there to ensure standards of care and improve care within the NHS. And it's a very well trusted and uh, respected body, so to get guidance on their website it, it is very helpful to getting the word about, about what's going on. We also uh, got national agreement quite early on with respiratory colleagues to prioritise actually interstitial lung disease patients, sarcoidosis patients, to have access to breathing tests. Um, some of you may or may not know, but the lab shut, shut down for a while, causing problems and backlogs. So, so that was good that we got that access uh, agreed early. And I think the other important thing that we did is we took action early to protect ILD patients by adding them to shielding lists. Now, again, if you joining us from abroad, you might not be aware about what shielding is. I, I think it was a bit of a UK thing, the terminology, and I'll come on to that and some of these points a bit more as we go through the, the slides. So what about website guidance? Obviously, I've mentioned we had a, an interstitial lung disease um, document, um, but actually, like many other medical specialist societies, when COVID hit, we had to open up a web portal and, and a hub for information. Of course, because COVID is primarily a respiratory problem, everybody was wanting to know information and wanting it from the respiratory people. So over a very short period of time, weeks, we produced about 30 pieces of guidance and, and it was no mean feat. And initially it was a very small number of us at the BTS that were leading on this. And then as time went by, we managed to get more people involved and some of our uh, specialist advisory group members who have got experts on help to put some of these documents together. And you have to remember that this, is, this was happening while the first COVID surge was going on. 
So all our respiratory colleagues were either working extra shifts, uh, extra long calls, and were absolutely hammered at the time. And uh, they were doing these things at night, at weekends, uh, under great pressure. And it's a real credit that they, they got some of this work out there. I remember this first period of COVID as being one of the worst of my life, and being very, very tired with all the things that we were having to do. So people did really well to get all that stuff out there. The documents are quite widespread, actually. We cover certain diseases and how they should be managed during COVID. Things like procedures. How can you do a bronchoscopy where we put telescopes into lungs to get to samples and things? How can you do that safely in a COVID environment? There's a lot of aerosol generation, people coughing. How do you do that safely without harming the patient, harming the staff? Um, also, um, procedures like um, lung function tests. How can you do those safely? We need to get our evidence out there to keep our patients safe, to keep our staff safe needed the staff to be at work to look after all the patients. Also extending out into the community. So a lot of our airways patients with COPD and asthma managed actually a lot in the community and we needed to extend our advice out into their care as well to make sure that everyone was looked after properly. Um, we also had to collaborate very closely with other specialist societies, particularly, for example, the Intensive Care Society. These patients were ill with a respiratory breathing problem. They might start on a medical or a chest ward. They might transit into intensive care, transit back out. We had to agree between us what were the right uh, points that we would escalate their care or de-escalate their care. And we had to ensure that guidance that was coming out from different medical specialities was saying the same thing. We didn't want one specialist society to say one thing and one another. For example, around the effects of sarcoidosis patients, a lot of patients might be on drugs that suppress their immune system. And we had to, to link in with the, uh, societies like rheumatology who use a lot of these drugs because we didn't want to give the rheumatology patients different advice to the to the sarcoid patients because it would have been extremely confusing for patients and also uh, we wanted to give clear messages where possible so there's a lot of back chat and uh, information sharing going on and also talking to the charities um you know where there was patient information coming out we wanted to get that out through the charity uh, avenues because the charities have been amazing supporting patients and getting information accurate information out to patients so there has been a lot lot going on um uh, just early on just to give you a couple of examples um i remember very early on uh, one of the first sort of controversies we had was is it safe for people to have a nebulizer if, if they might have covid and of course initially swabs took a long time to go back we didn't know whether patients had covid or not and we put them in different areas so on the top right of the slide, there's a picture there of a, a nebulizer mask, there's a sort of mist coming out of it, which is the nebulized drug. Mm -hmm. uh, nebulizers look different, but there's a chamber underneath where you put liquid drug. And then um, the, the tubing goes to a machine that pushes air through, nebulizes the drug into this aerosol, and it makes it very easy for patients to inhale it. Now, most commonly, that sort of drug would be used actually for asthma or COPD, perhaps. And those, those nebulizers can be, be life-saving treatment. But you can imagine if you think some someone's got COVID and there's all this steam coming off their face and at the time we were worried we didn't know how COVID was, was spread were we putting COVID virus particles all over the A&E area or all over the ward there was a lot of um, you know controversy and, and questions and, and, and worry understandably um, so we were actually in the end we were quite quickly able to put that uh, myth that it was dangerous to give nebulizers and it would spread COVID to bed um, but if we hadn't have hit on that and got that sorted out earlier, people would not have got drugs that they need that could be life saving. Another example is over the use of CPAP, that stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. And the bottom picture on the right is a picture of a circuit of face mask going into a yellow sort of oval shaped filter down to some oxygen tubing and some tubing to a machine. This is a, a sort of typical setup that we might use to give CPAP, which we are very familiar with this chest position. We used it for a long time for people with sleep apnea to help them sleep better. But we were using it now to deliver oxygen. And that, that wasn't done very commonly before. And certainly outside of chest units, it wasn't really done by anyone else. So, but the patients that were with uh, COVID weren't just sitting on chest wards, they were sitting on medical wards. And sometimes they were being looked after by, by non-respiratory doctors or surgical teams with physicians paired up. So these other teams were not familiar with these circuits, how to keep them safe. How, the import, how important it was to put this extra bacterial filter that we don't normally use in the community outside of COVID. These filters will stop the disbursement of viral particles. So, you know, we had our own patients to look after. We were also outreaching to other teams, supporting, checking that paid patients on these pieces of equipment were safe. Um, and, and that guidance we were putting out was very important for lung doctors to check what was right and also for non-lung non -lung doctors to, to make sure they were doing the right thing. So, 
I had no doubt in my mind that some of the advice that we gave out, it made things safer and it saved some lives. And um, so that's very important. And you might wonder, well, was it used? Was it accessed? Did anyone listen? Did anyone read it? Well, we've got some data now from 13th of March 2020 through to March 2021. Um, our systems tell us that we've had 345,000 views of these documents now. We've had over 280,000 downloads. Um, that's around a thousand visits a day to our website and 750 downloads per day. This is, traffic is huge compared to the normal sort of traffic we get pre-COVID. It's a wonder that some of the websites and the internet didn't crash at points. Um, and actually, if only 10% of those downloads helped a clinician and, and their patient, the BTS there, if only 10% was helpful, helped 28,000 clinicians during that year. So it was a massive amount of work. Moving on, I mentioned that we got uh, an escalation of our guidance, not just on our website, we got it out with a, a NICE guideline. During COVID-19, NICE has produced 36, approximately, I think, rapid guidelines across many disease areas, across all of medicine. A fifth of those guidelines have had significant respiratory input, obviously, because of the disease. And so we've had a lot of input into a lot of guidance around interstitial lung disease, different diseases like asthma, COPD, cystic fibrosis. And again, this was all done when, when the spiritual doctors were under a lot of pressure. So, um, you know, it wasn't easy to do. Why is it important to get these documents out? Why doesn't just our website? Well, it's important because it reaches a wider audience. People can access the information. They will use the NICE website for uh, reliable information. And importantly, I think for interstitial lung disease, as I've highlighted in red here, we managed to get into this document about something about shielding. I'll come to shielding in a minute. But it was quite controversial shielding and as many of you will know interstitial lung disease was not on the original shielding list which caused quite some problems for me and all our colleagues as you can imagine but we got a mention about shielding in here and this is the first sort of public national document we got it in and got it written in i think that was an important step forward we also made it clear in this document that ild centers were open for business we were still there to see patients who were getting ill and needed urgent rapid Treat, but we could still see patients face to face if it was important to do so. So we made that clear in this document and, and that went out there. We talked about blood monitoring and how GPs could help with that and GPs were great, they helped with the community blood monitoring. We also mentioned things like home spirometry which wasn't really documented anywhere else apart from on our website that it was okay to use this to monitor patients where needed so the patient could remain at home and remain safe but still have uh, assessment of their condition. And interestingly, when I was reading it the other night, we put quite a little bit in about not stopping steroids and not stopping immunosuppression on our patients. And at the time, that was actually quite controversial because we know now steroids are good for COVID most of the time, but back then people were worried that they would harm people. And actually we got that into this document as well. So don't stop the drugs unless you've got a good reason. And that may have, in retrospect have been a very sensible decision. Um, I mentioned about us getting priority for ILD patients to get access to breathing tests. You may or may not have been aware, but when the initial shutdown happened in the UK, where everything shut down, our labs shut down completely as well. We had no access to breathing tests. And this is because in, in the early phases, it was felt that uh, doing breathing tests would be an aerosol generating procedure, an AGP, another word that's come into our vocabulary since COVID, along with other, other strange words that we use now. So this means that because patients cough often during a uh, breathing test, that we know that coughing can release COVID into the, into the air and that was considered to be a risk. It might uh, make the room in, infected with virus, if you like, and it might infect the staff. So um, we had to, when things were shut down, we had to then make everything very COVID safe, COVID secure to reopen those labs and get the tests going. So there was a backlog where no lab service was available. And then once it reopened, because to make it COVID secure, we had to do a lot of air changes, uh, leave time between the room, clean the machines. All that took time and there are less slots, but we managed to agree with our colleagues who were very supportive that to start treatment, stop treatment and change treatment ILD, it was important that we got the access to the, to the lab tests. We were second in line to cancer, which is for obvious reason, cancer services did continue as much as they could. But then we got uh, the next access to ILD, uh, to, to breathing tests, which I think was very important. And so far as I'm aware, there's been no outbreaks through labs. And just so you know, breathing into the machine, the machines don't get anything inside them. They don't get infected with virus because there's lots of um, filters and things. So the machines are quite safe. Uh, this is about cleaning down the outside of the machine, cleaning the room, which is all, all in place. And we've had no outbreaks, which has been uh, immense credit to our uh, lab staff. Um, shielding, I mentioned briefly before. So um, we know in the UK, ILD patients weren't named. Other respiratory diseases were named. A lot of controversy, which I don't have time to cover, really, but 
um, there was a lack of communication perhaps between the chief medical officer and the specialist societies, at least that's our perception. And uh, this led to perhaps some diseases that should have been in there were left off. But what we managed to do is we managed through the ILD community to contact all the specialist centres and get letters sent out to our patients. In Liverpool alone, I had to send out over a few days, 2,700 patients letters from my clinic. And at the time we had no administration staff because they were either sick or diverted elsewhere. The doctors and nurses were all busy on the ward and it, it was hard to do, but we did it. Um, some people um, may feel that we, we overprotected patients, um, but there was an opportunity to review their shielding status and unshield them if necessary later. Shielding is important because for those who might not know about it, perhaps those of you who are listening in from abroad, it, it uh, permits access to support networks, get people helping you to get your shopping in whilst you're staying inside. It can also give you protection against being sent into, into an un unsafe workplace for you. It can be difficult though, obviously the isolation and the mental health issues you get with it can be very tricky. Um, hurrah, shielding ended yesterday. This is a good thing because obviously we're moving forward and getting away from the serious end of the pandemic now, we hope. Um, that is also though going to cause some anxiety because people might have to look at whether they can go back to, to work, which involves discussions with your human resources department, occupational medicine input, but a very nervous time for patients. Um, just a quick news flash, I don't know whether you're aware, um, oh sorry, uh, shielding meant as well of course that patients got early access to the vaccine which has been a good thing I think for our patients. If you hadn't been on the shielding list that wouldn't have happened, you'd have to wait to turn the sarcoidosis patients often in the younger end and would have waited much longer. This is a news flash, this has come out two days ago and I suspect people may not be aware of it yet, but it's important for sarcoidosis because uh, a significant number of sarcoid patients will be on immune suppression. You are now able to access early vaccination for your partner, uh, family, carers, household contacts over the age of 16. We don't know how you get that access yet, they've not told us that, but who lives with you will be able to get vaccinated earlier to protect you. So that's a bit of a news flash item. Uh, this I think is virtually my last slide. This isn't a COVID thing, but many people have talked about the BCS clinical statement on polysarcoidosis today and how that's going to hopefully improve care. It wasn't done during COVID, it got published during COVID. And I just mentioned it as something else that we're doing around sarcoidosis. And also just to mention, I don't have any time left to talk about it. Pete's about to switch me off, tell me my time's up. Um, we do run a national sarcoidosis registry. And I, I hope, all I say is I hope in the, in the future it plays a bigger role in improving care. This is my last slide, just to acknowledge COVID has been a nightmare for practically everyone. Uh, here's some um, colleagues here who are wearing PPE, another word that we wouldn't have known in the past. Um, well, we're all pretty sick of COVID, I think. So here's my attempt to cheer things up. Uh, this was me working on Christmas Day, trying to uh, cheer everyone up. But I think I'm scaring people actually. And I'd just like to say thank you to everyone. I'm sorry I'm getting emotional, I don't know why. Uh, thanks to everyone who's worked really hard. Um, and to all my respiratory colleagues, sorry about that. Lisa, uh, that was a wonderful talk. And actually, after you've had a glass of water, you should go and have a look back at the chat and see just um, just how much. I couldn't pull it. <laughs> have a look at it afterwards and have a look at just uh, how much the work that you and other members of the BTS did really for, for the community, for the patients, but also uh, for us as as um, as consultants and healthcare workers. In the area. So we're very grateful. We're actually um, pretty grateful for, for, for all that work and for your talk. So thank you. Um